Hi there, welcome to another segment of In the Green. I'm your host, Susan Fawcett, and today we have with us David Cobb, who is the Green Party presidential candidate. So, um, welcome, David. And I just wanted to say, first off, um, this election is particularly sticky uh, with everyone, all the ABB syndrome or anybody but Bush. Why are you running? What do you hope to accomplish? Well, campaign. well, thank you, Susan. It's a, really a pleasure to be here in Michigan. You know, the Green Party in Michigan, like Green Parties across this country, are growing, getting larger, stronger, and better organized with every election cycle. So it's a real honor for me to be here in Michigan, campaigning in Michigan, and it's a real honor to be representing Greens in Michigan, and indeed Greens across the country. And I guess really that's the answer to the question. Why should the Green run a presidential candidate in this election year? because we need to run a presidential candidate in this election year. We need to run a presidential candidate in every election year. Sadly, election law requires it in many states for us to simply maintain our ballot lines. And in addition, we need to put it into context. You know, the Green Party is growing throughout the country. In 1996, when I first joined the Green Party, there were only 10 organized state Green Parties, and there were 40 elected officials. In 2000, at the beginning of that campaign, the Green Party had grown to 21 organized state Green Parties. We then had 87 elected Green Office holders. Today, in 2004, in this election cycle, we've grown to 44 organized state Green Parties across this country. And right now, there are 207 elected Green Office holders. So by objective, concrete numbers, the Green Party really is getting larger, stronger, and better organized. So why should we run in this election cycle? Because we have to. Because the Green Party is the party of peace, of racial and social justice, of real democracy, and of environmental protection. Because the Green Party is articulating a genuine progressive agenda that goes beyond this one election cycle of Kerry and Bush, uh, or even Ralph Nader or anybody else. The Green Party is in it for the long haul. We're in it to win it. And I don't mean just this one election cycle. I'm talking about we're in it to win fundamental systemic change in this country. I'm proud to be the Green Party's presidential candidate, and I'm especially proud to be the presidential candidate in a year when it is only the Green Party who opposed, as a political party, opposed the war in Iraq before it began, where the Green Party is calling for universal health care, we're demanding that the minimum wage be raised to a true living wage, the Green Party is calling for an end to the racist war on drugs, we're calling for a fundamental transformation of society. Frankly, we should acknowledge John Kerry is a corporatist and a militarist. John Kerry voted for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. John Kerry voted for NAFTA, which is devastating the economy of Michigan and the entire country, and has us in a spiraling race to the bottom on both wages and environmental protections. John Kerry voted for the Patriot Act, which is literally assaulting our civil liberties in this country. John Kerry uh, voted for No Child Left Behind, which is dismantling and destroying the public education system in this country. John Kerry is on the record opposing single-payer universal health care. John Kerry is on the record opposing raising the minimum wage to a living wage. John Kerry supports three strikes and you're out. You know, by every objective measurement, Susan, John Kerry is not a progressive, He's not articulating a progressive agenda, and he is not going to provide progressive leadership. But I also want to acknowledge, as bad as John Kerry is, George W. Bush is qualitatively worse. He and the neoconservative cabal who surround him are a genuine threat to the planet. They have basically declared war without end on the rest of the war world, definitely a war over oil. Um, uh, John, George Bush is worse. I like to say... John Kerry is bad, George Bush is worse, and the American people desperately need, need and deserve much better. And that's where the Green Party comes in. We're the future, and I'm proud to be the Green Party's presidential candidate this time. It's great. I, it's, it's definitely necessary to have, um, someone put it that there are, if there's two pro-war pro candidates, then there should be at least two anti-war candidates. And <laughs> right. Ralph Nader is also running and has a lot of the same same ideas as the Greens, but has a slightly different strategy. How do you feel that that his race impacts what you're doing? 
Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge on a personal level, I'm a lawyer because of Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird and Ralph Nader. Uh, Ralph Nader is a public icon and a personal hero. When, I man when Ralph Nader asked me to manage his presidential campaign in the state of Texas in 2000, it was one of the greatest honors I had ever had. Uh, I hold Ralph in incredibly high esteem. Uh, having said that, Ralph Nader chose not to seek the Green Party's presidential nomination. Ralph Nader said, I will not accept the Green Party's presidential nomination even if offered. Instead, Ralph Nader chose to, to seek an endorsement of the Green Party, just as he at first sought an endorsement of the Reform Party and others. Um, so Ralph decided to run an independent campaign. Uh, only lately is he sort of putting together Reform Party people and, uh, and other things. So, you know, I just want to acknowledge that Ralph chose not to seek or accept the Green Party's presidential nomination. Uh, no single individual has probably done more to help grow and build the Green Party uh, since 1996 than Ralph Nader. However, today there are over half a million of us, Susan. There are 300,000 registered Greens in this country right now, and you can only register in 17 states. If you count Greens in all those other states, there are over half a million Green Party members. Uh, and with all due respect to Ralph Nader, those half a million activists and growing are bigger than Ralph Nader the individual. So Ralph has chosen to run as an independent. It's his right to do that. I support his right to do that. But at the end of the day, the main difference between David Cobb and Ralph Nader is that David Cobb is running a campaign as a Green Party presidential candidate, making growing and building the Green Party the entire core and message and goals of this campaign. My goals in this campaign are to make sure that there are more registered Greens at the end of the campaign than there were at the beginning. My goal is to convince other Greens to run for office too, to convince them that we're capable of running our own individual campaigns. Frankly, that we don't, celebrity candidates are great, but we're not going to always have celebrity candidates. We as Greens have got to roll up our sleeves and do that work. The third thing I want to do is to make sure that there are more Green Party ballot lines, and I'm working very hard to try to make that happen. And the fourth thing that I'm trying to do in this campaign is to ensure that we end this campaign with rank and file Green Party members with more capacity as organizers, learning how to do media interviews, learning how to do grassroots organizing, learning how to do the logistics that are necessary in order to run a national presidential campaign. And frankly, Susan, even though it's only September now as we're having this conversation, I can tell you for a fact I am succeeding. I am winning because I am accomplishing our, my goals. Uh, so I, I applaud all the work that Ralph Nader has done, but at the end of the day, this is about the Green Party and my commitment to growing and building the Green Party for the future. That's great. What exactly do you see the future of the Green Party looking like in this country and elsewhere in the world? Well, you know, Susan, I should tell you that at the inter it's, I appreciate you pointing out not only in this country but also in other parts of the world because I want the, the studio or want the audience and your viewership to really appreciate that the Green Party is a global party. We are a worldwide party. There are Greens across the world. There are Greens in elected office across the world. Greens are providing leadership across the world. In fact, Greens across the world are actually at the forefront of saying no to the Bush agenda of war. Greens across the world are saying no to empire because that's what's happening. U.S. foreign policy now is actually based on an empire. It's not an American empire based on American values of liberty, justice, and equality. It's an empire based on corporate values of greed, exploitation, and oppression. It's a transnational corporate empire and American tax dollars pay for it and underwrite it and the blood of American servicemen and women lubricate that empire and it is an empire that is grotesquely uh, abusing and oppressing people, of pe particularly people of color in the global south. And globally the Green Party is the solution. Greens across the world are, are getting elected and are serving in elected office. And I think it's important to understand that the main reason that Greens have more success uh, in other parts of the world where they're actually members of their national assemblies, the, their version of, of the Congress, uh, and elected uh, up and down uh, the various levels, is for one reason and one reason only, the voting system. 
because the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world uses a much more democratic voting system than ours called proportional representation, where if you as a political party get 10% of the vote for in a national race, then you get 10% of the seats. Susan, if we had proportional representation here, I assure you there would be Greens not only in the Michigan State House and the State Senate, there would be Greens representing the state of Michigan in the U.S. Congress right now. So where do I see the, growth, the Green Party? I see us continuing to grow at the local level because we're already growing. You know? And those candidates, when elected, are demonstrating that Greens know how to govern. We really have not just ideas, but we can implement those ideas, and those ideas are common sense solutions. Ultimately, we're going to force a change in the voting system because this so-called two-party system does not work. Fewer and fewer people are voting. Fewer and fewer people are turned off. More and more people are joining the Green Party. We're electing more people. Ultimately, I see the Green Party providing the wedge necessary to actually open up the political process, open up the political discourse in this country. Think about it. The discourse and the range of acceptable conversation in this country is the most narrow than it is in any other country in the world. And it's all about a flawed voting system. I see the Green Party as being able to open that space up and move towards genuine multi-party democracy where we can start to develop a real genuine pluralistic society where everyone feels like not only is their voice heard, but that they actually have representation. Somebody representing them in the halls of Congress somebody representing them in the state house here in the state of Michigan. That's where the Green Party is headed. In fact, like what happened with Ralph Nader in Florida in the 2000 elections, what do you think we could do about that? Well, you know, Susan, I appreciate the, the way you've asked the question. Because the reality is what other people call spoiling, Greens call participating. We're going to exercise our democratic right to participate in elections. Uh, and as we continue to participate, it's important to remember we continue to win. And it's because people who are watching this conversation now are recognizing, wow, Susan and David make sense. Greens make sense. We really do need to change this system. We really do need to get the troops out of Iraq. We really do need sustainable energy. They realize that we're right. So we're going to participate. And if anybody really believes that the Green Party's participation is a problem, well, Susan, surely the problem cannot be to squelch the Green Party voice of candidates or restrict voter choice. You know, the solution is to change the voting system. And the solution is actually quite simple. It is called instant runoff voting. Instant runoff voting is a system that is used all over the world in Australia, New, Ze New Zealand, Ireland, London. Uh, in this country, it's already used in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's going to be used in San Francisco. It's been used in the past in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it looks like Ferndale, Michigan, actually might be using it uh, for its mayor's race. I mean, instant runoff voting is a voting system that's extraordinarily easy to understand. You know, it's not just in politics. You know, Susan, the reality is that college football uses instant runoff voting for the Heisman Trophy. Major League Baseball uses instant runoff voting for, major league, for most valuable player. The Academy Awards uses it. And the Utah Republican Party is currently using instant runoff voting. Demonstrating it's not just a left-wing idea, but it's just a good government idea. So what is instant runoff voting? It's a voting system that actually empowers the voter. Instead of just having to choose one amongst the various candidates, the voter is empowered and encouraged to rank order their, their, the candidates, to fully express their opinions about the various candidates by saying, my first preference is amongst these candidates, my second preference is, and my third preference is. We like to say that it's as easy as one, two, three, because all the voter has to do is rank one of their preferences amongst candidates. First choice, second choice, third choice. Counting the ballots is equally easy. You simply count first preference ballots that are cast and ask, did anybody get a majority of those first preference votes? Because if so, then that candidate is elected, because it's a majority rule system. Unlike our current system, where somebody can get elected with less than a majority of the votes cast. So, Instant runoff voting requires a majority rule. So if nobody gets a majority of the first preference votes on the first round, then you say, all right, who got the fewest number of first preference votes? Because she or he can't win. You eliminate the lowest vote getter under this instant runoff voting mechanism and say, all right, you're eliminated as a candidate. 
But under instant runoff voting, the people who voted for that candidate didn't waste their votes. Why? Because they've already indicated their second preference. Their runoff preference is already indicated on that ballot. So rather than the need for an expensive, costly, additional runoff or an additional election that costs the taxpayers money and has to be administered and bring you back to the polls. You are the attended. Very poorly attended. Thank you for bringing that up. The, the second round runoffs are always very, very much lower voting participation. Um, so we you transfer those ballots and now say, now do we have a winner? Did, did anybody get a majority? You simply go through that process. I would encourage the the viewers of uh, In the Green to check out the Center for Voting and Democracy, which is a nonpartisan group available online at www.fairvote, F-A-I-R-V-O-T-E dot O-R-G. Uh, Fairvote.org is the website for the Center for Voting and Democracy, and I would encourage anyone who really thinks that this voting system should be changed to get involved in their local community and work with us to change the voting system. That's the solution to the spoiler effect. And the last point is this, Susan. Voting participation is going down in this country, yet membership in the Green Party is going up. So the two-party system is failing, but the Green Party is growing. So I think that instant runoff voting would really go a long way towards helping not only the Green Party, but actually to reinvigorate democracy. It's not just that it's a good idea for the Green Party or for third parties. It's that it's a good idea for our democracy for people to feel like they're actually casting meaningful votes and that they're not, because it's hard to get excited about voting against something that you really hate instead of for something that you really want. And instant runoff voting provides that space for the voter. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your running mate, Pat LaMarche, and what he's up to? I would love to. I am so very excited uh, and honored to have Patricia LaMarche as my running mate. Uh, and I think, that, as you know, Susan, Pat is actually coming to Michigan as well uh, sometime in late September, I believe. Um, Pat is actually uh, a well-known activist in the state of Maine, where she's from. She's a single mother of two who raised her children without health care. She's a working class person like myself. She knows what it's like to actually be living in this country as a working class person. Uh, and she struggled. But also in her struggles, she was able to be an activist for homeless issues and for women's issues and for children's issues, well known in the state of Maine uh, as such an activist. And in fact, when she ran for governor in Maine in 1998, as a Green, she got 8% of the vote. You know, that's a phenomenal uh, accomplishment in this so-called two-party system. She helped to earn the Green Party of Maine, the independent Green Party of Maine, their ballot line. Uh, so uh, Pat is a fantastic campaigner who really connects with people and is a very exciting campaigner. Um, she's currently on a left out tour, we call it. She is actually uh, campaigning across the country and she's going to be staying in homeless shelters every night on this tour to draw attention to the plight of those who are left out and not discussed by the two corporate controlled major parties. And in fact, Pat will be here in Detroit on October 3rd. So I really encourage those of you who are watching this program to go to our website, www.votecob.org, or the Green Party of Michigan website, where you can find logistical information on October 3rd when Pat LaMarche is going to be here uh, in Detroit. And that website is www.migrensmigreens.org. Fantastic. And so, what Pat is doing is going across the country, talking about the issues of the homeless, talking about issues uh, of the lack of health care, talking about these issues that are not talked about, the growing underclass, uh, the incredible poverty rate in this country. 40 to 50 million Americans without health care. Uh, over 20% of the children of this country living in poverty. You know, it's a sin, Susan. It is a profanity, literally. Uh, to be living in a country of such incredible wealth and yet to be amidst such poverty. And so Pat's tour is designed to draw attention to the problem and also to point out that there are solutions. Universal health care could be implemented right now in this country where health care would be available to all if there was only the political will to do it. And Susan, the Green Party is the only political party 
demanding universal health care. The Green Party is the only political party demanding that the minimum wage be raised to a true living wage so that everybody can raise themselves above the poverty level and live in real dignity as a result of their own work and their own efforts. So Pat's campaign is going to be a fantastic campaign and I'm very proud of the fact that we have a gender balanced ticket on the Green Party. You know, we are the only candidate, the Green Party is the only political party that's running both a man and a woman for president and vice president. And I'll tell you this, I'm very committed that in 2008, the Green Party ought to be putting it out there that we're going to make a real diligent effort to try to have a woman candidate for president in 2008. I'd love to see that. How old are you, Susan? <laughs> I've, I've, I've got another 14 years before okay. I can run. Well, you know what? My, my estimation had always been that, that we'll probably be electing a president in about 2016. So you might want to be starting to groom yourself now. We'll see. Um, well, you were talking a little bit about health care, and I'm just curious, what, what would a green health care system look like? First and foremost, let's remember that the transition that, that's going to be required is going to be the kind of cultural transition that the Green Party always, already represents. You know, it's not going to be from one moment to another that we change, but instead we do transition into, into these kinds of changes. Because by the time a Green is elected president, there will also be Greens in the United States Congress and in the state houses. I mean, we're talking about fundamental political and cultural realignment. Um, but the ultimate solution to the health care crisis is, first of all, to acknowledge that it's a genuine crisis. You know, we have 40 to 50 million Americans without access to affordable health care in this country, even more children. Uh, and that number is going up every day. So the solution is to make sure that we ha treat health care as a fundamental human right. You know, right now the health care system is actually working. If you understand that the health care system is currently designed to treat health care as a commodity that is bought and paid for as a profit. And it's working because it's providing an immense profit to the pharmaceutical corporations, to the insurance corporations, and to the other corporations who have hijacked it. However, if we wanted to treat health care as a right, then we would say it's not working at all because so many people don't have access to it. So that's why I say the system is broken because we're framing it differently. It shouldn't be a commodity that you buy and sell merely to profit. So the way you move to health care is by treating it as a right. And the best system that does that is single-payer universal health care based on the Canadian model that says we're going to allow doctors and patients to have a genuine patient-physician relationship that we don't want to interfere with and we don't want the government to interfere with. In fact, we're going to encourage you, the individual, to seek out and find the doctor of your choice. However, we're going to say to the doctor, a doctor, we're not going to allow you to overcharge this patient. And in fact, we're only going to have government pay for the charges that are incurred. So you basically eliminate the pharmaceutical corporations. You eliminate the health, so-called health maintenance organizations or the insurance corporations. You would completely eliminate all of that bureaucratic uh, paperwork to which we already know right now a huge percentage of healthcare dollars are being skimmed off and funneled off into bureaucratic administrative uh, waste charges and we would skim off uh, the, 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 the corporations, the insurance corporations and the pharmaceutical corporations profits. And in so doing we would actually improve and increase the amount and quality of healthcare and the cost would go plummeting downward. And that's been demonstrated by the General Accounting Office. Right? So the way to move to health care, first and foremost, is to build a political movement and awareness for it. And that's another reason why I'm urging the viewers of this program, vote for Green Party candidates for office because we're the only political party advocating for single-payer universal health care. That's great. Another important issue that is, seems to be taking up a huge segment of our budget is, is, is our military endeavors. and. So I was just wondering if you'd like to talk a little, about, little bit about Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, yes, and I thank you very much, Susan, for reminding us that it's not just Iraq, but it's also Afghanistan. The Green Party was the only political party that opposed the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan with marches, with speeches, with, with teach-ins. I mean, we opposed those wars from the very beginning. Um, and we're currently calling for the, and I as a presidential candidate, am calling for the immediate withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq. 
bring our troops home now. There is no doubt that the U.S. military presence is not viewed as an army of liberation. It is, in fact, viewed as an army of occupation. You know, Susan, you can tell the difference because an army of liberation is greeted by the people with candy and flowers and much rejoicing. Currently, that's not what's happening. Uh, there is genuinely an uprising of the people of Iraq, and we are breeding more terrorists every day with this continuing occupation. If we want to actually uh, do the right thing, both morally, ethically, legally, and for good, solid foreign policy, we should bring the U.S. troops home from Iraq now. What do you think needs to happen in Iraq? Or, or what role should the U.S. play in, in trying to, to bring about democracy to this country? Well, it's, a, it's really a, sort of a two-part question, isn't it? I mean, what should happen in Iraq? Well, Iraqis should decide what should happen in Iraq. We, we should actually understand that the Iraqi people have the absolute fundamental right to autonomy and self-determination, and they should determine what kind of country they, they want and, and will have. Um, now, what, so the question is, though, what role should the U.S. have? Well, right now, because we are viewed as such uh, invaders and conquerors, we really are in no position to provide any space for that to take place, um, which is why the U.S. troops need to, to be withdrawn immediately. If, and I want to say that's if, there is a legitimate need for a peacekeeping force, then it seems to me that the appropriate uh, uh, force should come from forces from the Islamic world, under the auspices of the United Nations, from troops who speak Arabic, so that we can attempt to de-escalate the class of civilizations that the Bush-Cheney administration has created in Iraq, to actually provide the space that would be necessary in order for the people of Iraq to actually rebuild their country. Now, when I say bring the troops home now, I mean it. But it's not in isolation, Susan, because the Green Party, and I'm talking about, first of all, an apology to the people of Iraq, a sincere apology for the grotesque uh, policies that the Bush-Cheney administration underwent. You know, the Green Party was not only opposing the war in Iraq before it began, but once it became obvious that George W. Bush lied to the American people about weapons of mass destruction and lied to the American people uh, about alleged links between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush lied to us into a war. The Green Party called for the impeachment of George W. Bush. I'm proud of that fact. And so any of the, the viewers who are incensed and outraged by this war, you should know the Green Party was the political party uh, that you should be a part of because we're the only political party telling the truth about Iraq. We're the only political party running candidates like myself who are telling the truth about the need to impeach George W. Bush because of this war. Now, the last part of the, of the question is not just to apologize and not even just to continue to impeach George W. Bush but also to make genuine reparations to the people of Iraq. I would immediately rescind every one of the corporate crony contracts that Bush and Cheney entered into with Bechtel Corporation and Halliburton Corporation. I would rescind every one of those contracts and I would make that money available to the people of Iraq to choose themselves how to rebuild their country that American bombs illegitimately, immorally, and unconstitutionally destroyed. That's the level of genuine uh, peace-seeking and waging of peace that the Green Party advocates, not just in Iraq, but in Afghanistan, and in fact in the rest of the world. Because at the end of the day, Susan, we have to understand that the U.S. foreign policy is fundamentally flawed, and the Green Party has an entirely new vision of how to conduct U.S. foreign policy. All right, thank you. I think we are just about out of time, so, so much, thank you so much for coming on the show, David, and I'm Susan Fawcett, your host for In the Green, and until next time.